talking about using software to stop being swamped by the work that you shouldn't be doing. Welcome, Pat, and thank you for joining us. Great to have you with us again today. Thanks, David. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yeah, and slides ready to go, mate. All over to you. Thank you. Ready to go. Fantastic. Good stuff. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the intro. And th Laura, that was really useful because that's kind of the territory I'm covering today, citizen development and stop being swamped by work you shouldn't be doing. So, um, actually, sun's shining today. High streets were opening up yesterday. So, uh, hopefully, with the impressive rates of vaccination, this year is going to bring, if not an end to the pandemic, at least it means to control it and live with it. However, COVID has definitely changed the world of work for good. What started as a, a short-term shift in priorities is now being viewed through a completely different lens. Digital First offers benefits to employees and customers, and many of the changes that happened in response to the virus are now becoming permanent. Uh, so, let me click, there we go. Right, so change is the new normal. As this stat from Gartner shows, the big working from home experiment was a great success. The genie is well and truly out of the bottle now, and although we all miss the office camaraderie, most of us do prefer to work from home. Cardiff University research found that about 88% of employees want to continue working from home in some capacity, and 47% want to do it more often or all at a time. And then Grant Thornton research into mid-sized UK companies, they say that about 74% are looking to decrease their existing office footprint by up to a quarter, and a further 12% expect to reduce it by up to a half. So the, the, the thing is, it, global spending, it was absolutely shattered. Global IT spending was shattered by the um, response to the pandemic. But Gartner was predicting its rise to about 3.9 trillion dollars that's 6.2% up on last year and the good news for our industry is that we're now more important to our organization's success than we've ever been but um, we're going to have an awful lot of work to do so many of the initiatives that you guys would have put on hold last year like hiring staff updating infrastructure rolling out new products they're going to be kick-started again but there'll be significant changes there'll be a complete shift I think in the distribution of IT spending with greater investment in things like security, supporting employees working from home, cloud-based infrastructure, and those low-code platforms that make it easier for citizen developers to automate and integrate processes. But for many IT groups, that's going to come at the expense of data centers, local IT infrastructure, and even IT staff. So make no mistake, we are entering a period of hyper-transformation, and we need the ability to adapt and deliver, or we risk becoming outsourced. That's why doing nothing now is a really bad idea. If we apply old practices based on some kind of mythical separation between IT and business strategies, we will fail to deliver value. If we can't move fast enough, we risk becoming the limiting factor of the very change that we're not only meant to facilitate, but lead. In, in the last year, digital transformation led forward a decade, and it's reshaping entire markets. It's also bringing a flood of new agile businesses offering highly accessible and cost-effective services. And with everything possible to moving to the cloud, offerings like device or desktop as a service, they're now legitimate competition for IT groups. So the new way, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and last year, I think we saw that with the way that uh, vaccines were released, but also it's driving some entrepreneurship within business. So in Q3 of 2020, the number of new businesses was up 30% on the previous year, and the biggest increase since 2012. And it's happening in other countries, in France, in Italy, in Germany, seeing the highest number of new businesses on record. What happened was this kind of COVID-accelerated digital change has actually reshaped entire markets. Digital retail gone to the roof. I mean, my wife was actually a physiotherapist, and telehealth allowed her to continue supporting her patients all the way through. So entire markets are shifting as a result of this. Virgin Media Business produced this thing, uh, basically calling COVID di digital change a £232 billion opportunity. Admittedly, that's by 2040, but about £75 billion of that is going to come by 2025. So the big question here is, can IT groups step up? Well, this is a piece of research just done this year, looking at tech trends from 2021, which basically said that about only about 6.4% of IT groups are ready for organizational transformation and only 14% expect the organization to be able to expand. That leaves 80% in the kind of optimizing, supporting and struggling category. And that's a real risk. And unfortunately, the signs are already there that outsourcing is on the rise. 
The value of outsourcing contracts in the UK rose by 60% in Q3 and Q4 of last year compared with the year before. Shared services, that's also increasing. Organizations in the same sector have just consolidated their resources to improve efficiency and save money. And these shared service organizations are often set up from scratch, an entirely new entity with a lot more autonomy and less baggage. They have modern tooling and that allows them to scale really quickly and still cope with a faster pace of change. And that's really critical to, to, to their success. And why? Because change is a big challenge for enterprise IT. Traditionally, the roles of IT ops teams have been pretty well defined, ensure that services are available and performing correctly, and then address issues as quickly as possible, optimize the available resources and support the deployment of new technologies. Changes used to be fairly infrequent, but in around 2018, enterprises started really embracing new technologies. And since then, the rate of change in IT environments has cons increased consistently by over 80% a year. Now, we don't have the data for 2021, but that green line is only going in one direction, and that's vertical. So at the same time, an IT ops team are being hampered by the amount of new tech, the tools they're using have become less effective. There is now a pressing need to update your service management and automation tools, but I warn you not to get caught up by shiny object syndrome. What I mean by that is there's been a huge amount of hype around things like AI and machine learning. Now, if you're taking 100,000 calls a year and you're taking a similar considered approach, like Siddharth from Capgemini presented this morning, and you fully understand your customer's journey, chatbots are probably worth looking at. However, if you're not at that level of maturity, placing another channel in front of your customers without determining how or even whether they'll use it would be a mistake. What you're doing is just using technology to address failure demand. And by that, I mean demand that's generated because you've either failed to do something or to do something right for your customers. And as a result, they come back and make further demands and your resources get eaten up because the service isn't effective. But when you understand your service and how your customers use them and the types of requests that they're happy to progress themselves, you are in much better shape. If you've got self-service supported by automation and integration, it delivers really highly visible value to employees. And once they get exposure to that, you will get inquiries from other business units asking you to help them solve some of their challenges. So keep an eye on emerging tech, but stop looking for silver bullets and don't throw technology at problems unless you're certain that it's going to add value to your customers. So my advice on that would be to first focus first on building relationships before you even start thinking about building, building algorithms. So what should we be focusing on? Well, here to me, this is the obvious one, self-service, that has to be the de facto channel. But we can't be looking at it just to reduce IT workload and cost, that's a benefit. What we're looking at is delivering that exceptional self-service experience. Offering things like working from home bundles, automatic software deployment, putting your policies up there, links to staff well-being and useful links to other areas that your employees would be interested in looking at. The second thing is automation. This is already quite high on IT agendas, but as we've seen over the last little while, and certainly with the registration of this session, it's now in overdrive. But as Laura was mentioning, you don't need to have developers. Well, certainly not for the low-code tools. And what you're looking to do really is to eliminate those kind of low value interactions. So, so basically password resets, account join, uh, joiners, levers, updates, software distribution, standard changes, all perfect targets to get rid of. Because those are calls that your users don't want to make and your service system really doesn't want to take. The next thing we need to focus on is this, speed. Because people are going to have to change and make micro adaptations on an almost a daily basis. So if your solution doesn't allow you to do that, you've got to think about replacing it because otherwise you become the bottleneck of the actual change you meant to lead. The next thing is self-sufficiency, back into that kind of citizen developer thing. So teams have to have the ability to adopt to these new operating models. And in that environment, they can't afford to be running big projects with kind of consulting partners and implementation partners. Those ways are too slow and expensive they must be able to do this stuff themselves. So what I'll do here is just give you a really brief look. Uh, this is just starting with self-service because this is where your users come in. And this is how you can put them in front of the technology and the automation to make things happen. So standard self-service login, just go here. It will take me first of all to the page I was last at. And in this case, it's just our HR thing. And you can see some benefits, a little ticker in the middle, but if I want to go to just IT, 
I just go ask IT, and there's my little bulletin saying that we got a problem with Link. I can do my usual stuff like searching. I've got problems with VPN, and it will show me the most common FAQs with things like embedded videos with things to try. Also, common requests for that service type and requests I've logged already on there. So if we go back up here and just take a look from a HR perspective, what you'll see then is just basically all of the HR services, the useful links. I can go in here and say, actually, I just want to update my details. I want to log into benefits and actually enroll in the company vision plan or dental care plan. Useful links to other stuff and then HR policy documents, the type of things I need to pay attention to. And again, back to the working from home. Again, we've got all our who's online, quick links, policy documents, top FAQs, links to other areas like feedback and mental health and well-being, for example, say. So, getting back to our service, if I go in here, I mentioned home bundles. Don't make people think about what they need. Actually bundle it for them. Show them the cost if that's what you do. And then allow them to do things like say, hey, I want a second monitor, I need a printer, copier, and scanner, and click finish. And once it's done that, basically the tool in the background will just take care of the assignments automatically, and then now it needs to go to someone for approval. Once that's approved, the other task can start, and we'll come up with that in a moment. We go here again, simple stuff like getting apps. So let's say something that doesn't require authorization, I want Zoom, I'd like it installed on all devices, and it just says click finish, it'll be deployed and available shortly. So once I click finish, what happens in the background is the process automation actually deploys the tool and closes the call. Nobody's had to get involved, the user's just done this themselves. So just to show you where this kind of magic happens, we go back into the back end. So this is the kind of layer that's dealing with the assignments. And if we go to the fulfillment, this is where it happens. So here's some parallel processing. And what you'll see here is there's some yellow boxes on here. These are automation points. So if I just click into this, it's just basically creating users in Azure. I can show you what's going on. So we click into the integration list of out-of-box integrations. We click into Microsoft. Then I just choose Azure. And what we're looking here is users. And now I can update, delete, password reset, all of those type of things. It is literally that simple. So just to show you how easy it is to design one of these, just drag out a node here, and then we say we want a cloud automation, click on the properties box for the cloud automation, and then go to the list of things like BMC, ServiceNow, Beyond Trust, SolarWinds, all of these things can be automatically integrated with just the out of the box connectors, and that's just the, the, um, the cloud side. There's a whole heap of stuff that happens in the background for your on premise or behind the firewall uh, item tools. So my advice to you in this, uh, if you want to demonstrate value, uh, you might be doing a huge job and improving IT, left, right, and right, and center, but are, are you adding value that really gets you noticed? If your colleagues are struggling with things you've lost this resolved, there's an opportunity there to really add value that's very, very visible. Because every day your employees are engaging with a multitude of different services from IT, HR, facilities, legal, and people are forced to kind of disparate systems and different channels with inefficient silo working practices. The whole kind of concept of disjointed processes, reliance on emails, spreadsheets, homegrown applications. What that means is basically staff have no visibility of the progress of their requests. So they're getting a poor ex service experience and also lost productivity. But on the other end, service delivery teams are getting hammered with unnecessary calls and low value interactions. So if you want to show real value, then I believe ESM is the biggest opportunity for IT since IT. And this stuff is not particularly hard to do. I'll just cover some of our customers here. London Borough Brent's shared services, um, they're bringing in a million pounds in revenue each year in shared services and shed 400,000 pounds off their costs before the pandemic by closing office space, uh, simply because 100% of everything they do now goes through self-service. Of course, people can phone up in an absolute emergency. Uh, Mid in South Essex, here is a shared services organization that operates three different hospitals, and each of them have got their own operating procedures and processes, but they've designed the self-service interface that basically allows all of the uh, people across those three different sites to log in and have a consistent kind of view, and they've automated pretty much everything with all of those complex processes hidden from the user. And again, here at University of Portsmouth, this to me is the, the classic thing. We're always talking about showing IT value. 
But these guys, replacing older systems across IT, marketing, registry, and others, use cases are still expanding, and they're managing 150 services, and the important point, adding value across the entire business. So folks, that's it from me, and I'm not sure if we got much time for questions, I hope at least. David, we got any questions? Yeah, thank you very much, Pat. Yeah, some really sage advice there, I think, again, which is really cool. I think, yeah, I think we've got a couple coming through. And and in the main, I think they do centre on um, the integration capability of something like what you sh what you just showed there. So the integration capability and also um, sort of from an, uh, from an out-of-the-box situation, right? So how easy is it to integrate with things? Um, and also, Yassem, you mentioned that. Um, and any any thoughts on you know uh, uh, sort of uh, that being applied those integrations automation across the business so maybe in HR an onboarding process to kick off activities for IT and facilities and other parts of the organisation what are your thoughts on on that? Right. Okay. So we have got loads of customers doing that. So basically, it's it's almost like an end to end process flow. So you have your HR process. So let's say an onboarding thing as you mentioned. Uh, that comes in via HR doing their thing, but actually managing stuff through the actual interface itself and, and basically once they've actually recruited a new candidate or something they just basically progress it and it escalates all the tasks to IT. Now typically an IT person will be looking at that and going yeah okay that's all right just click approve. Uh, once they click approve in the background all this stuff goes off like get their AD set up, add them to these groups, uh, create a, a, an email account from, do this, that, the other and all those activities can be automated all the way through. And that's all standard out of the box stuff. So I think there's something like 700 different integrations that we provide at the moment, or seven or 800 standard out of the box with all the common tools. But also in the back end, you can integrate with, uh, we've got our own ITOM tool, which allows you to do all of that. But you can also integrate with HP Open Orchestrator, um, Microsoft SCCM, all of these other tools um, that are provided and common across the industry. Uh, and literally is point and click stuff. The variables all there, it's all been figured out for you. You don't need any development or coding skills to be able to leverage that type of automation. Yeah, cool. And I, I've got one I'll ask myself if I if I could. Um, so so we, over the last sort of few months or so, I've been talking to some organizations and, and they're almost in a situation where they're looking to decentralize, right? Decentralize services. We've always centralized, haven't we, for a long, long time. Centralize stuff in the service desk, centralize this, create those silos. What do you think about how this type of technology uh, or this approach, automation, ESM, what do you think that means for uh, organizations actively looking to decentralize service? What do you think of that, Pat? I, I think it's it's a fantastic opportunity. I mean, we, we just as an organization ourselves, we stopped uh, work when the, the government announced uh, closures on Monday. Um, on Friday, we're all happily working. The following Monday, we actually just all moved out of the office. Now, our lease is coming up in our building, and we're thinking, actually, it's going to be a buyer's or at least a, a leaser's market over the next little while. And we just moved all of the office stuff out, and basically, it's all the cloud now. We don't need to have a centralized location. Obviously, we will have a centralized location for customers to come to and stuff, but as a business, we can operate fully. We have full visibility, we've got our own collaboration tools, but actually we had the advantage of doing this for the last seven years. So we're mm -hmm. well ahead of the game in that respect. So I think any organization is now who's looking to decentralize these things, this type of automation gives them a handle on doing things that wouldn't have been possible, uh, mm -hmm. we'll say half a decade ago. Yep. Yep, I agree. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Pat. Thanks for your time. We're really great to catch up again and listen to that. And um, hopefully we'll have a chance to do it again soon. Thank you, All Pat. Right. Thanks, David. And next, we're going to welcome Greg Charles.